Hi, for those of you who have joined us, you can go ahead and, and um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, respond to some of these demographic questions that are in the polls. Um, that would be great before we start. Thank you. And um, for those of you just joining, um, if you could answer some of the demographic questions that are in the polls and you have to scroll down, there's a few, um, that would be great. Thank you. We'll get started in a few seconds. Well, it's looking like it's the, the top of the hour. I see people are joining us. Um, we are I think, going to get started. Um, if some of you still see those demographic questions, feel free to continue to respond to them. But anyways, um, so welcome uh, um, to uh, today's session. Um, on Substance Use Disorder 101, Part 2, How Should We Care for Substance Use Disorder in Patients with HIV? My name is Sandy Springer. I'm an infectious disease and addiction medicine physician and professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. Um, I'm seeing in the chat that there's no sound. Can people not hear me? Oh, some people have sound and some don't. So I'm going to continue and, and hoping that everybody has sound. But if we, and um, uh, I will be moderating today's session. And um, the presenter I'm happy to present is uh, Dr. Ellen Eaton, who is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and is in the section of infectious disease. Next slide, please. Hopefully, okay, so sounds good. I'm, I'm seeing, reading the chat, that's good. Um, so uh, this is part of a, a six uh, series um, um, uh, that we've had one lecture already. This is the second one uh, regarding um, the DEA training requirement. Um, so just to remind everybody about the MATE training. Um, so uh, we're glad you could join us. Next slide. Um, this is just pointing out that in addition to the series of webinars that IAS USA is um, supporting, there's also on their website that you can see here under the activities, a DEA compliant CME resource center. So if you missed the first one, um, you can go and watch that. It's recorded now and all of the others, including one today will later be um, recorded so that uh, individuals can and watch that and the subsequent lectures as well that are coming. So this is uh, the series, um, part one uh, and part two now um, is happening today. And the uh, part three will be happening uh, later. Um, uh, this month is, uh, uh, excuse me, it might be in October, initiating buprenorphine in the fentanyl era. And that's the next one coming up. And then you'll see there's one on stimulant use disorder, harm reduction and contingency management, alcohol and tobacco use disorders, and then some future directions, including long acting forms of opioid use disorder treatment. So we also wanted to point out for all of you to, if you are not aware, there is the UCSF um, National Substance Use Warm Line and the number is right here. And you might wanna put that in your phones that you can, it's staffed by addiction medicine, HIV specialists and pharmacists to answer any questions regarding substance use and HIV management. Um, first, uh, it, we're also happy to point out that there is CME associated with this, um, including 1.25 AMA PRA category requirements, or, and also 
It's approved um, uh, for ABIM mock points, 1.25, also nursing, pharmacotherapy, and pharmacist uh, um, activity. We want to just point out that uh, there, these are the disclosures for the content on the web board listed here. And then um, also the disclosures for myself, Dr. Eaton, and the reviewers of this particular session. We also want to um, uh, point out that we have generous support for this activity that's been provided by a number of contributors. And just a few minor points, um, you'll see some poll questions that are going to come up in a separate window. Um, just choose your response in the poll. And then uh, also just if you do have questions, please use the Q&A button, not the chat button to put your question in. And we are going to answer uh, as many questions as we can at the end of Dr. Eaton's um, webinar. And the chat is always open. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, present Dr. Eaton. Thank you so much, Sandy. And let me get my slides up and going. All right. Um, as Sandy mentioned, I am an infectious diseases physician, and I have been treating opioid use disorder in patients with HIV for about four years now. I am not addiction medicine board certified, and I'm saying that to encourage you all to take on substance use treatment as part of your routine clinical care, regardless if you are general medicine, infectious diseases, HIV, it really is best practice and it's best for our patients. So um, without further ado, we're going to talk about how we should care for our patients living with substance use disorder and HIV and our disclosures here. Learning objectives. We're hoping that today you will leave with more comfort in initiating treatment for substance use disorder in your patients with HIV, um, that you can evaluate alternative plans to help patients with substance use and HIV, especially around staying engaged in care and having the ability to really educate your patients on substance use disorders and the importance of overdose pre prevention and harm reduction. Before we get started, I wanna frame this talk around stigma by using inclusive and patient-centered language. So terms that promote stigma that we will be avoiding are terms like addict, junkie, user, alcoholic, um, substance abuser, um, referring to urine tests as dirty um, and persons as dirty or clean patients. What we can do to reduce stigma and include patients in their care, engage them in a um, therapeutic relationship is really using terms that decrease stigma, like person first language, a person with substance use disorder, um, negative or positive urine tests, um, describe them as in recovery rather than um, abstinent, um, or the alternative referring to someone who is, um, in active use as an addict or a junkie. Um, you can describe their behaviors as risky or dangerous or harmful rather than assigning a value or judgment to those terms. We're gonna start with a pretest question and you all will see these answered at the end. So um, just be patient with us if you don't figure it out during the course of the session, we will answer for you. All right, let me move this over so I can read. You're providing care for a patient with newly diagnosed HIV and opioid use disorder. The patient expresses a strong motivation for starting ART and medications for opioid use disorder. You're considering initiating buprenorphine and ART. If you were to recommend an integrase strand transfer inhibitor to use concurrently with buprenorphine, which strategy to manage potential drug-drug interactions is indicated? Would you A, reduce buprenorphine dosing um, if using L-vitegravir with cobacistat? Would you increase dolutegravir to twice daily if using buprenorphine? Would you increase buprenorphine dosage if using with bictegravir or dolutegravir? D, are there no dosing adjustments? when using integrase inhibitors? Or E, do you need more information to answer this question? I'll give you just a minute to vote. All right, we'll move on to the next. Oh, there we go. Um, we have our poll responses here with the vast majority, um, about 60% saying D, no dosage adjustments are needed. And that is correct. And we'll talk about 
more in a, towards the end of the session. Okay. All right. Let me advance that slide. Next pretest question. You have a 34 year old man who presents to care after a recent hospital admission for acute alcohol intoxication complicated by a fall and pneumonia. He's diagnosed with alcohol use disorder. He has an eight year history of HIV with a viral load of 3000 copies per mil and he reports difficulty adhering to his ART. Which of the following is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy for his alcohol use disorder? Is it A, a cancer Ampersate taken orally three times a day, disulfiram taken by mouth daily, extended release injectable naltrexone every month, or D, none of the above. I'll give you a minute to think about your selection. All right, and great. 88% of you selected extended release naltrexone, which I also think is the ideal option for this patient. Great job with the pretest questions. All right. We'll start with our outline of the talk now. We're gonna start with overviewing medications for opioid use disorder. We're gonna talk about the impact of these medications on HIV outcomes and integrating this treatment into your care. And then we'll discuss stimulant use disorder, alcohol treatment and tobacco use with a more um, 50,000 foot view. I do want you to know that we'll discuss these other use disorders more in depth in future sessions as part of this IAS USA course. Um, so this is gonna be an introduction to these other use disorders with more details to come in future sessions. This is a really startling update from last week. Um, overdose deaths continue to rise in the US. So we have hit another record level in the last 12 months um, of provisional overdose deaths in the US. More than 111,000 people died from a drug overdose with most of those thought to be related to opioids. So really startling and this is our why and our context for why you're here and why we all have a role to play in ending the um, drug use crisis in America. In terms of FDA approved medications specifically to opioid use disorder, um, we have three that are highly effective, two more so than others. Um, in general, we prefer opioid agonist therapy. Those are the first two columns on the left. Methadone and buprenorphine are both mu opioid antagonists with methadone being a full agonist, excuse me, I said antagonist, full Opioid agonists, methadone and buprenorphine, methadone being full, buprenorphine being a partial agonist. And on the far right, we see naltrexone. Sorry, I had a phantom slide there getting us back. All right, so we're now on extended release naltrexone. That is an antagonist. Um, if you start with methadone, many of you know this is an oral daily medication. It is required that you provide this within a licensed drug treatment program. I cannot provide that, for example, in my HIV clinic under current policy. Um, we have to provide highly structured clinical and pharmacy settings. It does have overdose potential being a full agonist. It does interact with some antiretrovirals, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, however, it reduces HIV risk behaviors and we know it reduces overdose. Um, so methadone is a good option, is FDA approved. Next, buprenorphine, which many of you have heard of, a partial agonist. It is um, available in oral, uh, excuse me, sublingual films, sublingual tablets implants and injectables. I think the most common formulation used in the US is the um, daily sublingual um, method, but certainly we're seeing more injected, injection of the long actings available in various clinics and pharmacies. It can be provided in your HIV clinic. As I mentioned, I have an opioid treatment clinic embedded within our HIV clinic at UAB. This medication is safer than methadone, does not have the overdose potential, less interactions with ARTs. It does reduce HIV risk behaviors and overdose and has been shown to improve viral load suppression. So a really great option. Lastly, extended release naltrexone. As I mentioned, it is the only antagonist you'll see here. Um, most commonly, we see long-acting injectable naltrexone for opioid use disorder, um, not to be 
confused with the oral options, which we, we may talk about with alcohol use in the future. Um, in terms of the setting, this can be given in a primary care clinic, an HIV clinic. There's no special licensing required for naltrexone. You should also know that it treats alcohol use disorder as well as opioid use disorder. Um, there are adherence advantages to a long-acting injectable, right? For many of our patients, taking something daily is, is challenging. There are no overdose or diversion concerns because it is an antagonist, not an agonist of the opioid receptors, reduces HIV risk behaviors and overdose and improves viral load suppression. I will say that for naltrexone, because it is an antagonist, if your patient misses their medication or decides to stop, they are then opioid naive. Um, and we do see a higher risk of overdose in that population who has been on an antagonist, then transitions off or falls out of care, and then is exposed to non-medical opioids, um, returns to opioid use, there is a risk of overdose there. Um, one thing I wanted to refer you all to as future reading, something that you can read on your own, share with your trainees and your team. Um, Sandy and I published along with um, Nick Saval, a, a practical guide for the ID physician to treat opioid use disorder in the setting of infectious diseases, including HIV, Hep C. And we really walk um, the provider through step-by-step -step how to approach this patient. So something to flag for your um, teaching files and for your own personal reference. Um, next, we're gonna move to a case um, that's a little different background, we have a 46-year-old man with HIV and opioid use disorder who had a recent stroke. He's coming in for hospital follow-up. He was started on buprenorphine co-formulated with naloxone during his admission, and he's now taking three tablets a day. He reports he's doing well with his opioid use disorder and has not taken any non-medical opioids. He reports occasional crack cocaine usage, so stimulant usage, in addition to this history of opioid use disorder. Which of the following is associated with continued use of his buprenorphine naloxone? or other medications for opioid use disorder, which is associated a reduction in viral load suppression, a reduction in quality of life, a reduction in overdose risk, or a reduction in ART adherence. And I'm looking at this question, I'm wondering if we have it, the options are not aligned. Yes, yes, and I that this is correct. Reduction in overdose risk. I think in my mind, reduction in viral load suppression. So continued. Let me just make sure I state this correctly. Continued use of buprenorphine is associated with viral load suppression. So it enhances the risk, the rate, the likelihood that your virus goes down. Um, so you all read this correctly, though. So buprenorphine in someone with HIV is going to increase the chances that they can keep their viral load down through the mechanism of taking their ART. You're gonna improve their quality of life. There is data on that, we'll talk about that. You're gonna reduce their overdose risk and you're gonna enhance their ART adherence. So C is, correctly, and I, is correct, most of you got that and I apologize um, that that wording may be a little confusing. Okay. All right, and I wanted to pause and ask Dr. Springer about this specific case. Um, I included this case because I'm seeing a lot of stimulant use disorder or stimulant use in the context of opioid use disorder. And I have seen providers come to me and say, well, they're still using drugs so that this um, buprenorphine is not working because they're, look, they're continuing to use crack cocaine. And what would you say to that provider or um, staff member who's concerned that you're providing maybe futile care by continuing the buprenorphine in that context? Yeah, Ellen, it, it's a good question. And unfortunately, it's very common. Uh, so cocaine is our main stimulant here in Connecticut. And I know methamphetamine is more common in, in your state, but it's very common, you know. Um, but what we say is, you know, buprenorphine is a treatment for opioid use disorder. Unfortunately, it does not treat stimulant use disorder. I, we wish it did, right? Unfortunately, there's no effective yet FDA approved medication treatments for stimulant use disorder. So it's just really important that we are aware of that. And the patient 
um, we want the patient to continue to stay engaged in care. And so stopping their buprenorphine because they're using stimulants is only going to put them at risk for continuing to use opioids and potentially de death through overdose. So um, what we need to do is if we recognize that they are using stimulants is help them as best we can with treatment for stimulant use disorder. And as I'm sure you're going to discuss also uh, additional harm reduction services. Thank you, Sandy. And I think something you taught me, I think you're the one who taught me this, is that we should use use disorders like chronic other diseases, opioid use disorder and stimulant use disorder, like hypertension and diabetes. If one is not well controlled, you don't stop the medication for the other. And similarly, if your stimulant use disorder is not well controlled, um, you don't stop the treatment for opioid use disorder. So thinking about these as conditions that are chronic medical conditions, which they are, um, helps me frame them. Absolutely. And we wouldn't stop somebody's diabetes management if they weren't able to, if they came in um, with a, an uncontrolled sugar and forgot to take their diabetes medicine or, and like you said, had another co-occurring disorder. So we have to think the same. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, now we're going to get into the details. So say you have diagnosed your patients with opioid use disorder, and you're thinking about initiating buprenorphine, a partial opioid agonist, as we mentioned, you want to remember that either your patient is has not used for a while, has, has no longer um, any opioids in their system, and that may be the case. They may come to you and say, I've been in recovery for four weeks, but I'm craving. Can I start buprenorphine? You can start that patient in the clinic that day or send them home with a home induction. However, if they are still using and have come to you for help, you're going to want to counsel them that they need to be in moderate to severe withdrawal um, before they initiate their buprenorphine. And the risk is that if they start um, buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, while they have opioids, they're non-medical heroin, fentanyl, Percocet in their system, when they initiate buprenorphine, those buprenorphine... Um, Medica that medication will replace their fentanyl, kick it off their opioid receptors, receptors and put them into what we call precipitated withdrawal. So for that patient who is still in active use, you want them to be in withdrawal. And I talk my patients through, um, and many of them are very familiar with what their symptoms are. They start having tearing, they start getting GI upset, they may have goose flesh where their hair on their arms stands up, they're irritated, they're agitated. Um, and I encourage them to wait until they are in moderate to severe withdrawal. This is a scale here. This is our clinical opioid withdrawal scale. I, when I first started my clinic, I was very uncomfortable going through this counseling. Now it's become, after a couple of patients, become much more familiar and comfortable to me. And as I mentioned, your patients who have opioid use disorder are, know these symptoms. This is part of their life. So um, talking them through, you'll be surprised how, how um, quickly they catch on to that concept. Many of them have also had experiences with precipitated withdrawal. Many of my patients who have come to me as new patients actually have tried buprenorphine from a friend or family or someone it was prescribed for in their community. Community, and they can already tell you they know how to induce it because they've tried it before. Maybe they tried it incorrectly or they tried it correctly. Um, counseling is still important. Um, this is the old way to start your buprenorphine induction. And just to point out, we published this in 2020, and this field is changing rapidly, as is the drug supply, right? So when I started prescribing in 2019, we did not have a drug supply that was saturated with fentanyl. Um, but we now provide people with more buprenorphine early on day, day one of their induction, because we know many of them have been exposed to this highly potent um, opioid in the community, fentanyl, and they will need more buprenorphine sooner to treat their withdrawal symptoms. So we used to start with two to four milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine on day one. And if they um, tolerated and had persistent withdrawal or cravings, we'd add two to four more milligrams in a couple of hours of buprenorphine for about eight milligrams of buprenorphine max on that first day. And the next day, day two of their induction, we'd recommend maybe eight milligrams in the morning and another eight in the afternoon or after a couple hours, it's still withdrawing. Now we've realized most people will need at least 16 milligrams of buprenorphine in the first 24 hours. Um, some providers will start even more, 24 milligrams a day in the first 24 hours. Um, we'll talk more about this. And we also have another session in this series on um, opioid use disorder treatment in the fentanyl area era. So just a, a, a call to continue, stay with us in this series so that you can get a lot of content around fentanyl era. Um, 
What I'm doing for a lot of my patients who are using an act, they're in active use and they're using fentanyl. Um, and I'm also going to get Dr. Springer's thoughts on this. Um, most of my patients, I'm doing something called uh, a buprenorphine microinduction. It's also called a low dose induction. There's literature on this in the hospital setting for patients who are transitioning from prescribed opiates for pain control. Um, but there's also literature coming out in the community of people who are on, there's dependent on high quantities of fentanyl, it's very hard for them to go um, with withhold fentanyl for long enough to reach moderate to severe withdrawal. They, they are so dependent, the cravings are so intense, the withdrawal is so uncomfortable that it's hard for them to start that buprenorphine eight milligrams, as I showed you on the last slide. So what is being done increasingly is this microdosing and the the rationale is really that you're slowly replacing the fentanyl on their opioid receptors with buprenorphine gradually in a gradual way so that they do not have this precipitated withdrawal um, where you're giving them eight milligrams and all of a sudden a lot of fentanyl on their receptors is displaced. They're in precipitated withdrawal. Rather, you're gradually up titrating the buprenorphine to replace the fentanyl. So you may say, does that mean patients are still using? Yes. In a lot of times, yes. Um, so what I tell my patients when I send them home with this prescription that tells them how to start with tiny 0.25 milligrams and increase their dose over the next week and call me, um, what I tell them is I would never tell you, Mr. Smith, to continue using fentanyl because I know it is highly fatal and we're seeing lots of overdoses. However, if your symptoms are so severe and you choose to continue using non-medical opioids, you can and should still continue this taper that I am giving, giving you. In fact, it is safe. And in fact, in fact, patients who continue to use non-medical opioids can safely get themselves on a full dose of buprenorphine with this microinduction at home. Um, and I've had some patients who have been successful, and this has been the only way they've been able to get themselves safely on 24 milligrams of buprenorphine over the course of seven to 10 days. Um, and so you can see here, here's an example of a microdosing schedule. Um, I will say if you see this little table day seven, they have someone on 12 milligrams. It's much more likely that my patients by day four or five are up to 16 milligrams a day and, and they're able to escalate their dose. Um, and thinking about this type of patient, um, Sandy, I'm just curious, are you doing many of these microinductions? Have your patients been successful? And then are you sending them with any PRNs around withdrawal and symptom management so they can do this dose escalation at home in a relatively comfortable manner? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and there are more and more, um, uh, as you said, uh, providers that are doing this, what we call a home induction um, or, you know, where you live induction um, strategy. Uh, we, uh, we're in particular, I'll say um, in the hospital setting um, that started out through a National Center for Advancing Translational Science randomized control trials, starting individuals in the hospital who have infections and opioid use disorder onto long acting buprenorphine. We've uh, had to, in several cases, um, initiate while they're on these long-acting opioids, which started out with potentially their own opioid, which was maybe a, a fentanyl short-acting, but adding on top of that long-acting opioids for pain control, some of whom had been started on methadone while they were in the emergency room, um, started this trans this transition uh, period so that we can get them onto sublocate really quickly um, within maybe five days or seven days. Uh, so we've, we've done that and you don't have to take their opioid off just as much as what you're saying to the patient who's out in the community. So yeah, no, I think everybody, um, there are also people who are uh, doing even faster than that. So somebody who's actively using fentanyl, um, initiating maybe one dose uh, of buprenorphine, then giving them uh, long acting uh, buprenorphine on the same day in 24 hours. Um, John Mariani and others have published on that. So there's different strategies. And I think what is most important is what you said, listening to your patient and trying to meet them where they're at and how they want to do it. Because the worst thing to do is tell them to stop all opioids, go into withdrawal um, and potentially overdose because of the withdrawal symptoms. So really meeting people where they're at and doing these low dose transitions can be really, really helpful, like what you've just illustrated. Thanks, Sandy. Um, all right. 
uh, we're going to move into some more of the benefits of medications for opioid use disorder. So all three forms that we discussed of FDA approved meds for opioid use disorder decrease opioid use, prevent overdose and reduce mortality. They decrease the risk of transmission of infectious diseases like HIV and Hep C. They improve psychosocial outcomes like job, the ability to get a job, keep a job, improve quality of life, decrease criminal behavior, which we know is essential to keeping people in the community engaged in HIV care. Um, and buprenorphine and methadone um, can both also treat opioid withdrawal and pain, um, pain being increasingly con common in patients with HIV, right? We're seeing patients live longer with more um, various forms of pain, neuropathic, musculoskeletal, et cetera. Um, in terms of the FDA treatments, I, I just wanted to go through again quick, quickly. We talked about buprenorphine and methadone being fe feasible in primary care settings integrated with HIV and Hep C care. Patients with chronic pain can be safely induced on buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is used um, as monotherapy for pain in many patients. Um, one thing to know is that the analgesia of buprenorphine is not as long acting as the treatment of opioid withdrawal and cravings, which last for days, but the pain control does not. And the reason I bring this up is that in my HIV clinic, often my patients who need 16 milligrams or 24 milligrams of buprenorphine a day, I have them split those doses to control their pain symptoms because the analgesia will wear off shorter. So they may take eight milligrams twice a day or eight milligrams three times a day for a total of 24 milligrams of buprenorphine. And these are patients with um, a lot of chronic low back pain, who maybe were led to opioid use disorder through prescription pain medications um, and then developed um, aberrant use, dependency use disorder. So they have underlying pathology. And in this case, buprenorphine is managing their opioid use disorder and their pain. Um, extended release naltrexone, we mentioned it's feasible in primary care settings. Um, no, um, not necessarily for acute pain, it is an antagonist, as we mentioned, um, and patients must be free from opioids for at least se seven days, and this makes sense, right? It is an opioid antagonist. Um, methadone is only available, as we mentioned, in federally licensed clinics, and patients with chronic pain can be safely um, induced on methadone, um, but we did that this can be done in the hospital setting, but there are obviously policy um, and practical restrictions on transitioning to outpatient methadone care because based on current U.S. policy, methadone cannot be delivered in routine primary care settings, unlike buprenorphine and naltrexone. So impact of meds on HIV outcomes. As we've alluded to, medication treatment improves both their substance use outcomes and their HIV outcomes, which make it make addiction treatment really important for public health, which we don't think of. We don't think about opioid use disorder as an infectious disease, but it is associated with many transmissible infectious diseases. Um, this is data from Sandy um, and colleagues looking at recently released um, prisoners living with HIV. And what you can see here is that with buprenorphine, these um, persons with HIV and substance use reported over time a reduction in cravings. You can see the circles here and an increase in satisfaction. You can see on the left with these squares, um, mean scores, Likert scares being close to 10 in terms of satisfaction. And on the right, you can see in terms of percent of positive um, urine results, you can see that over time in these patients who, again, had HIV and substance use disorder, that 30% um, 30, 30 and decreasing down to more like 20% had opioids, non-medical opioids in their system over time. And um, cocaine use also declined in this cohort with HIV, substance use, and buprenorphine. So really great data um, on quality of life outcomes, but also substance use. And... Similarly, um, a study looking at opioid use disorder amongst recently released um, from, uh, prisoners, um, you can see that those that were retained on buprenorphine for opioid use disorder over 24 weeks had statistically significant higher viral load suppression. You can see um, comparing time on the right baseline, three months and six months. Look at the percentage 
that had viral load suppression less than 50 at six months who were on buprenorphine. That was an odds of 5.4, so significantly more likely to have viral load suppression in that group who was engaged and retained on buprenorphine for 24 weeks. So again, it's improving substance use outcomes, as I showed you on the prior slide, and then HIV outcomes on this slide. We know that people who have criminal justice involvement are highly likely to transmit HIV due to the structures that they are in, uh, you know, mass incarceration, um, many other social determinants of health. So getting their viral load down, keeping it down is, is really essential for public health and, and individual patient outcomes. Um, this is systematic review, similar looking at meds for opioid use disorder on infection outcomes. Meds were associated with greater ART adherence, an odd of 1.55, and viral load suppression odds of two. Um, one of the questions that came in ahead of time that, that really gets to this point was, you know, what is the mechanism by which meds for opioid use disorder improve um, viral load suppression? I think it's ART adherence. You know, it, this, this data suggests that you take your meds for your addiction, um, you're less likely to have cravings, your life becomes more stable because you're not constantly looking for your next non-medical opioid, um, you know, survival sex, you know, transactional sex, unhoused patients, a lot of these things that go together, um, these social determinants of health. Once you treat the underlying addictions, patients have more stability in their life, less life chaos, they can actually adhere to their HIV medications and then their viral load comes down. Um, so that's the mechanism that I think the science is, is suggesting at this point through which meds for opioid use disorder improve HIV outcomes. So let's move to another case. You're providing care for a patient who's newly diagnosed with HIV and opioid use disorder. They're very worried about the HIV diagnosis, but they're reluctant to start treatment for opioid use disorder. He states he would rather focus on his HIV first and then treat his opioid use disorder. How would you explain the effects of maintaining concurrent opioid use disorder treatment on HIV treatment outcomes? Okay, A, improved HIV viral load suppression rates only with methadone via directly observed therapy, improved HIV viral load suppression rates only with buprenorphine or naltrexone, improved HIV viral load suppression rates regardless of the medication, D, no effect on viral load suppression with any of the approved meds, or E, unsure. And hopefully you will all get this. We'll give you a minute to select your option here. All right. See what we have here. Great. C is the correct answer, and almost everybody got it. improved HIV viral load suppression rates regardless of the medication used. Um, so the, some of the prior slides we just referenced clinical trials with MOUD broadly. So all three of those medications, any of the FDA approved medications have been shown to improve these this really important HIV outcome. So C is the correct answer. Okay, long acting forms of medication for IUD may improve retention and care and improve opioid outcomes and other infection outcomes. And I think Sandy alluded to this earlier. What we know is that there are many patients living with opioid use disorder, but very few, um, as few as one in 10 are actually receiving treatment in the community. Um, you can see this care continuum here from 2014, and I do not think it is any better, especially after the pandemic. So we have a lot of patients who remain untreated. In terms of the long-acting forms, um, we talked about uh, long-acting naltrexone. Um, we, we have not mentioned um, probufene, uh, sublocade we did mention, and then the other CAM 2038 or Brixati. Um, these last three um, we have discussed less. I'm going to focus on those. Um, probufene is an implant in the upper arm. It's dosed every six months. Um, it has been shown to decrease non-medical opioid use. Um, there is some training required. Supplicate is the subcutaneous injection that goes in the abdomen. Um, it is recommended that they have seven days of sublingual buprenorphine before they are started on treatment. But as Sandy alluded to, there are studies of people who are um, not uh, of providers who are giving a shorter, less than a week of, su of sublingual buprenorphine before transitioning to injectable. I think we'll see more data on that, um, more safety outcomes. This is a monthly dose, long acting and in, um, injectable, and it does improve reduce non-medical opioid use, does require refrigeration. Brooksati, 
um, is a subcutaneous injection. Um, weekly or monthly does decrease use uh, and will be available this month. Um, I'm gonna go to, I'm actually gonna ask Dr. Springer to comment, but I'm gonna keep this slide up. Um, Dr. Springer, tell us what you're using these long acting agents for what types of patients and settings? I think you referred to some earlier. Um, and I'm going to keep this slide up just so the audience can see the options here. I think you're on mute, Sandy. I think years of experience. Huh? But um, no, uh, so predominantly, you know, I just like you um, think it's a, it should be a patient choice. And then you also have to mash you know, which treatments they could use with other comorbidities, pain, withdrawal, et cetera. But um, the populations that we're really working on are working with are patients who um, might have more difficulty getting access to treatment, um, and particularly those who are hospitalized with concurrent infections, including um, not just viral infections like hepatitis C and HIV, but bacterial and fungal infections, as we're seeing with infectious endocarditis and others. Um, and then those who are involved with the criminal legal system in prison, jail, long acting forms, um, currently comparing a sublocade to extended release naltrexone to see if one might be more effective in retaining people in treatment. Um, and then uh, also individuals who are in the community and unhoused um, uh, and other um, populations like that. So those are just some of the um, patients that we're uh, trying to reach and uh, assess if they would prefer these long acting forms. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I am. I'm struggling with a couple of patients right now who are not quite interested in an injection. Um, and I, I think the research suggests that this is the better option for them due to adherence issues. Um, but I will also say the refrigeration and, and having staff who can keep up with your prescriptions, depending on what pharmacy you're using. There are some other administrative challenges with sublocade that my clinic personally is still working through payment. Um, but some of our clinics here at UAB have had have been able to launch this with great success. And, and my clinic, um, due to payment issues, really, um, we have not been able to get it off the ground, but I'm hopeful that is a goal for me in the coming year. So um, it's a I'll good be- point. It's a good point. They're expensive. And um, we live in a, a Medicaid expansion state and our Connecticut Medicaid supplies these. And so I think that's really important. Again, you know, um, medical care, insurance coverage are really, really important to allow patients to have access as they should to all options. So it's a, but it's a real world challenge. Absolutely. And certainly cost saving is, I mean, I have not followed the literature on cost effectiveness, but I can only imagine that if my patients had this option that required less clinic time, you know, currently I have to provide transportation. We have to use federal funding and safety net funds to get a lot of our patients to clinic for their frequent labs, for their frequent buprenorphine refills. And I think a lot of this could be cost saving for our health system if we we had access to these long acting options. Yeah. And we're doing a cost effectiveness evaluation for these um, and currently using mobile health clinics to provide them uh, going to where people live and now a mobile pharmacy that can dispense medication. So you know, I think they're all, there's all different ways that we need to think about it, just as you are saying is how to meet people where they're at. And, and, uh, but yeah, no, it's, they're all really good questions. Um, so more data hopefully will be coming soon. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. So now we're moving to integrating care. And these next few slides are really just to encourage you all to integrate addiction treatment broadly into your routine clinical practice. This is a white paper that Sandy and I were involved with from the National Academy of Medicine on how to improve opioid use disorder and infectious disease services in both hospital and community settings. So certainly really relevant for many of us who are HIV providers. We identified several action items, universal screening to diagnose these conditions, rapid treatment of opioid use disorder, um, treatment using hospital-based protocols to catch patients at that very vulnerable hospital setting and link them to community care, Um, increasing training. We know a lot of us were not trained on opioid use disorder. If you're my generation or older, we did not learn how to treat patients in our general medicine, family medicine, infectious diseases curricula. And pr- improving access to healthcare, and a lot of that is especially challenging in states that haven't expanded Medicaid, but really a call for more funding. 
Um, several other helpful manuscripts came out of this, which I'm highlighting one here from Annals from Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Todd Corthus, and um, Sandy Springer. So great resources for you and your trainees. Um, a lot of the barriers that we identified are still ongoing, unfortunately. Prior authorization can be a challenge, and I would encourage you to work with nurse champions, social workers, pharmacy champions. In my clinic, our pharmacy has been a big champion for prior authorizations. Um, the DEA X waiver has been eliminated, which is why many of us are here. We want to stay in compliance with DEA and learn how to prescribe. Um, so that has been achieved. Um, we still have same day billing restrictions. We still have restrictions on sharing information with mental health and, and addiction providers that keeps us from integrating care. Um, we need to reduce stigma as we discussed earlier. We need something similar to Ryan White wraparound services and safety net funding for patients with opioid use disorder. For example, my patients get really great opioid use disorder treatment because they have HIV and they're in an HIV clinic where they have access to a lot of federal funding. However, that same patient who's not HIV infected in the community has very little access to services. Um, so really a call for more HRSA funding, building workforce capacity, really um, actually expanding access to harm reduction like syringe service programs, which are illegal in my state, um, but have been shown to be um, highly effective at reducing infectious consequences like HIV, Hep C, and reducing overdose um, outcomes. And then lastly, criminal justice facilities should also integrate these treatments, linkage to care, um, and Medicaid enrollment at the time of release. So some things that we're hoping to see in the future to help us eliminate um, infectious consequences of addiction and overdose more broadly. A call for those of us who are HIV providers, we know we start ART same day, we should do the same thing with treatment of opioid use disorder, um, same day. Um, after we um, initiate medications, we should also provide screening, Hep B, Hep C, STIs, HIV. I, I can't tell you how many of my patients do not report their sexual risk behaviors, um, but I continue to screen them in some cases every three months, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm constantly diagnosing asymptomatic infections in this population, highly vulnerable, lots of stigma, a fair amount of undisclosed um, risk behaviors. As I mentioned, survival sex, a lot of my patients who are unhoused, that is their currency and their transaction. So a lot of, you know, huge need to do frequent screening for these co-infections, liver function testing, EKGs, um, not necessary prior to starting buprenorphine. Um, so there's really... <clears throat> and laboratories not needed before you start. You really need to start buprenorphine right away, then think about your screening, then think about any additional diagnostics you need. And also think about assessing housing, transportation, these other barriers to care. Um, and then Dr. Springer, thinking about these social determinants of health, I'll go back to that slide. What are you seeing in your practice? What is your biggest barrier to care? Yeah, big things. Um, you know, we have a small state, Connecticut, but there's a non-existent public transportation system other than maybe within the, the New Haven or, or Hartford. So people have difficulty transportation, transportation back and forth to clinics, um, housing, housing significant issue and can be a barrier. If you don't have a place to live, you don't have a place to store your medications. Um, you know, it's really difficult to even think about coming in for medical care. Uh, stigma, is a huge, huge one, as you know, um, not just uh, in the community, but unfortunately within our healthcare system. And a lot of these patients have been exposed to really negative um, experiences, including uh, criminal justice uh, settings, as well as um, unfortunately how they're treated in the healthcare system um, and uh, cell phone access and other things are also issues. So, um, you know, we uh, really importantly need to think about how to how to bring um, the care to them and how to help them get over some of those uh, issues so that they get the appropriate care. Great. Um, cell phones is one that I had not mentioned. That's a really important barrier to care. You can't reach your patients if they can't reach you. You know, how did anyone their appointment is? Yeah. Okay. Um, HIV and opioid use disorder co-management. I referenced this in one of the cases previously. Um, methadone and buprenorphine, again, um, opioid agonists, they are metabolized by the CYP3A4 enzyme. There are a few drug-drug interactions between them and ART. Um, potential drug-drug interactions between buprenorphine 
atazanavir, efavirenz, darunavir. Um, no significant interactions between buprenorphine and the first line antiretroviral therapy, which is really important. What you can see here is that there is a potential weak interaction between methadone and abacavir that may be um, relevant for some of your patients, but for bupren buprenorphine, that is not uh, a significant drug-drug interaction. Hepatitis C, this comes up, I think this might have come up in the chat when I was just scrolling through. Um, there are no drug-drug interactions between meds for opioid use disorder and the recommended hep C regimens. Patients should be counseled on hep C reinfection after they are treated and cured. Ideally, you need to counsel them before you treat them that this may cure them now, but they are still you know, vulnerable to reinfection and, and discuss strategies for preventing future infection. Um, if hep C reinfection occurs, you should promptly treat it um, because it is a marker for ongoing transmission risk. And here you can see the um, hepatitis C regimens on the left, and you can see no notable drug-drug interactions between the FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder. Okay, stimulant use disorder. As I mentioned, we're, we're going to give a broad overview of these additional substance use disorders and stay tuned through the IAS course for additional content. Um, you have a 46-year-old man with HIV and opioid use disorder. He's doing well on his ART and his meds for opioid use disorder, but he's gone from occasional stimulant use, smoke cocaine, to methamphetamine use, and he's now injecting methamphetamines multiple times a day. What is the appropriate next step? All right, hopefully you all get this right because we've addressed it a few times. A, you stop his meds for opioid use disorder as he no longer has an indication. B, you stop his meds for opioid use disorder and offer him contingency management. C, you switch his meds to extended release naltrexin, naltrexin. And D, you continue, continue his meds for opioid use disorder and offer contingency management. I'll give you a couple more seconds here. And let's see how the group did. Great. So he still has opioid use disorder, right? It is a chronic disease. He's done well on treatment. So we would continue that treatment for his opioid use disorder. And now he's developed a stimulant use disorder. And the only um, effective intervention that we have at this time is contingency management. So um, we did ad address this earlier. No need to stop his um, buprenorphine or methadone, but think about adding additive interventions for him. Okay. All right. A reminder to screen for stimulant use disorder. This is the NIDA quick screen, which has a reflex to the assist, which is a validated substance use screening tool. Um, this can be done in um, busy clinics and should be done in busy clinics. Um, the two item initial screen says in the past year, how often have you used prescription drugs for non-medical reasons and illegal drugs? And it can reflex to a more comprehensive screening for patients who, who select yes. For patients who have not used any of these, you don't really need to do any other intensive or time you know, time intensive testing, but really important to screen. If we don't ask, we won't diagnose. Stimulant use disorder treatment, as we've alluded to earlier, very challenging. We have no FDA approved effective medications for treatment of stimulant use disorder. Behavioral treatments are recommended. The most effective is contingency management that can reduce stimulant. This is exchanging um, a prize, an incentive. It could be a $5 gift card. It could be a um, $20 bill, um, but offering an incentive to reduce that behavior such that if a patient comes in and their urine drug screen is uh, appropriate, uh, maybe it has buprenorphine in it because they're taking buprenorphine. It has no, no other um, substances in it, they could get some sort of incentive. And that has been shown to reduce that behavior of substance use. Um, always, always offer other harm reduction tools for patients who use stimulants, syringe service programs, safer injection, drug testing, fentanyl testing strips, xylazine testing strips, if they are legal in your state. Um, also, naloxone should be given to everyone who uses any street drug, including marijuana, because there is such a high likelihood that they will get a contaminated supply with an opioid like fentanyl or heroin. Um, I also give naloxone to patients who have a family member who uses substances and to any of my patients who are on high dose opioids. Um, and educate them about how to use it. Also educate about the risk of overdose from xylazine. 
Xylazine is um, something you've probably seen in the lay press recently. It is also known as zombie drug or trank dope. It is a veterinary medicine with which is a sedative with analgesic and muscle relaxant muscle relaxant properties. Um, we are seeing a lot in literature about this being mixed with the drug supply. We're seeing a lot in the lay press. Um, it has been studied in humans as an analgesic, but it was terminated due to its severe, you know, basically dangerous side effects. You will encounter xylazine based on the data out of the DEA, which says that it is pretty much widespread. It is in Alabama in our drug supply. It is pretty widespread. People who inject may experience a range of side effects, slowed pulse, breathing, low blood pressure, fatigue. It can mimic opioid overdose. Um, this next statement I think is in question if it can be potentially partially overdose, uh, reversed with naloxone. There was a, a preprint that came out last week that suggested that xylazine is a agonist of the kappa opioid receptor and potentially could that be re reversed with naloxone. I think I would say the jury's not out. We need more study. But if someone looks like they are overdosing, do not question yourself. Give them Narcan. It's harmless if they are overdosing from a non-opioid. If you are a bystander, if you see it in your clinic or the parking deck, give them naloxone. It is very safe and you don't want to miss an overdose. Um, I should also point out that xylazine has been linked to the skin ulceration, which you will see here. I have seen reports that that skin ulceration and necrosis can be associated with non-injection, for example, smoking or inhalation of xylazine. I have seen reports that it can still cause necrotic cutaneous lesions. Again, I think this is a very evolving field. I don't know if the jury is out, but if you see this lesion, I would definitely start asking some really um, candid, non-judgmental questions to your patients about are they using, what are they using, how are they using it, and give them naloxone. Okay, getting towards the end here, alcohol use disorder. We know the prevalence of alcohol use disorder is two to four times higher in patients with HIV. We know it increases HIV transmission um, and risk behaviors. We know it results in poor ART adherence, increased viral load, and decreased CD4 cell count. It also accelerates liver disease in people with HIV. There are also validated tools to screen for alcohol use. We should all be doing this. This is evidence-based, it's recommended. If we do not screen, we will not know what our patients are using and how often. So here's an example of the audit C, which can be done in your clinic, a very short battery of tests. In men, a score of four more is positive for at risk for alcohol use disorder. And in women, a score of three or more is considered positive for at risk for alcohol use disorder. It is a clinical diagnosis, so that positive screen means you as the clinician or your clinical team then needs to ask more questions to make that diagnosis. And here's some more examples of the audit C. Um, treatment considerations. We know that for some patients, um, they are having high-risk behaviors. They may not have a use disorder. They just want to reduce the amount of alcohol they're drinking, maybe reduce from two to three glasses of wine to zero one glasses a night. Um, for them, pharmacotherapy can be very helpful. Um, a note here in the middle column, um, to definitely ask questions about alcohol withdrawal before you start a medication. If they have a history of delirium tremens or seizures, um, you want to know that ahead of time and you're going to want to seek likely inpatient detox because that can be a very high risk environment. Um, for a patient at home outside of a medical setting to try to reduce their alcohol use. Um, I, I remember that from my intern year, that was one of the lessons the residents really hammered home that alcohol use disorder can, it, in withdrawal can be fatal, unlike a lot of substance use disorders. And then lastly, a reminder that there are really effective cognitive behavioral therapies. There are 12-step programs, there are counseling um, adjuvants that you could add to pharmacotherapy or inpatient treatment. I also wanted to add here, excuse me, that there are a lot of apps that are becoming available. I know uh, some of my patients have had success with one called LESS, L-E-S-S, that is a free um, app. So, so lots of free apps out there that can help patients with um, motivation and, and incentives, keeping points, showing them how much calories they're saving, money they're saving. So um, thinking about behavioral interventions, that's a helpful one as well. Um, 
FDA approved treatments for alcohol use disorders. We've talked about these, so I won't spend a lot of time, but I mentioned earlier in the talk, oral naltrexone being a good option for alcohol use disorder. We also have an IM option. Um, remember, oral options are always challenging for patients with poor adherence. We've discussed that in a case in the very beginning. And remember that uh, long-acting naltrexone is a great option for people with opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder. Um, that was a question I think that came up in the chat, so that's that's a great option as well. Um, a reminder that treating alcohol use disorder also improves HIV outcomes, so a big theme of this talk, treat the use disorder, improve the HIV care continuum outcomes. What you can see here is that for people who were on um, long-acting naltrexone at six months here in red, had a statistically significant likelihood of reaching viral load suppression um, for that group that was on long-acting naltrexone. So treat the alcohol use disorder, improve your HIV outcomes. Lastly, um, we're going to talk about tobacco and nicotine. Um, cigarette smoking is a leading cause of mortality in the U.S. and worldwide. Tobacco increases many acute and chronic diseases like COPD and cancer. Nicotine is a natural alkaloid in tobacco that is associated with cardiovascular risk. And we see this, right? We see hypertension. We see um, strokes. We see myocardial infarction in people who smoke, especially um, in patients with HIV who have a longstanding history of tobacco use disorder. And it's important to know that HIV can confer an increased susceptibility to the harmful effects of smoking. Um, we know that this is treatable. We know there are effective pharmacotherapies. So this slide should say 2008. I actually looked this up before the talk because I, I thought this was more recent than 2000. But 2008, um, the Department of Health and Human Services said numerous effective pharmacotherapies now exist except in the presence of contraindications, these should be used with all patients. So we really should be prescribing these therapies for all of our patients who smoke. Um, and I know it takes time and it's challenging and involves some counseling and additional follow-up, but really it is in the best interest of our patients. Smoking cessation meds are approved by the FDA and behavioral counseling are cost-effective. They increase the likelihood of successfully quitting. Um, particularly when you use them in combinations. So combinations like short and long-acting nicotine replacement, nicotine lozenges or gum plus a patch, things like bupropion plus a patch can further increase the likelihood of quitting. And then capitalize on these life events, things like hospitalizations, um, surgery, lung cancer screening. I've had several patients who've gone to the ER with chest pain, that can be an event that you can capitalize on to encourage your patient to quit smoking. It was scary. It was traumatic. They know they need to quit smoking. They just left the ER. They're following up in your clinic. Let's start um, Varenicline and your nicotine patch. It's a great time to capitalize on that. Here's a list of the um, FDA approved first line medications for tobacco cessation. Um, I use a lot of nicotine patches. I use a fair amount of bupropion and varenicline as well. Um, I do use lozenges. I have fewer patients who like gum, but just a, a range of options here. Um, a lot of this is summarized in the um, 2022 recommendations on ART drugs for treatment and prevention of HIV. There is a new section on substance use. So just flagging you here, it includes not just opioid use, but other substance use disorders and the importance of um, HIV prevention and treatment in substance using groups. Um, just a few more slides to talk about social determinants of health. We've alluded to this earlier. Really treating this population requires meeting the patient where they are, low barrier access, walk-in clinic, um, street clinics, pop-up clinics, um, in parks where a lot of unhoused people live, partnering with peers, partnering with pharmacists, mobile pharmacies, telehealth. Um, a lot of these services can really be used to help reach this very vulnerable populations. Key recommendations, please provide screening and treatment for all patients with substance use disorders in your clinic. We showed you some easy validated screening tools. Um, please consider integrating this treatment into your HIV practice. You don't need a psychiatrist to do this. You don't need a counselor to do this. You can do this. 
if I can do this, literally, you can do this um, here in Alabama with a lot of barriers to healthcare delivery. Um, patients with substance use disorder and HIV should receive really integrated pharmacotherapy for opioid and alcohol use disorder, tobacco use disorder, and when possible, contingency management for stimulant use disorder. If you're in a state like mine, you don't have access to contingency management. There's not funding for this, but it can look other creative ways. So for my patients, contingency management, I don't have a way to give them a $5 or $20 gift card, but I can extend the period of time between when they have to see me next. Hey, you've been seeing me every week because you needed a lot of support, but things are looking great. Your urine looks great. You're in a better place. You feel supported. I'll see you in two weeks. I'll see you in a month, three months. So that's a, that's way that I've been creative with contingency management here. Persons with opioid and alcohol use disorder should be offered timely initiation of meds. We've talked about this. We talk about rapid ART for HIV. We should talk about rapid butte, rapid methadone. Think about peer support, telehealth, mobile units, walk-in clinics. All of these are really essential and evidence-based um, ways to meet people where they are and integrate care. They're highly effective treatments for substance use. Meds for opioid use and alcohol use improve HIV outcomes. Integrating treatment into care is the best practice. Tobacco cessation is really essential to reduce cardiovascular and pulmonary risk. And low barrier treatments and social supports are really essential. We're going to get back to those post-test questions, which I think you'll get correct, 100% correct now. You have that patient with newly diagnosed HIV and opioid use disorder. They're really ready to start ART and meds for opioid use disorder. You are considering buprenorphine and ART. If you recommend an integrated strand transfer inhibitor to use concurrently with buprenorphine, which strategy should you recommend? Reduce their buprenorphine if they're taking l, -L with Kobe. Increase dolutegravir to twice daily if they're taking buprenorphine. Increase the buprenorphine if using with bicpegravir or dolutegravir. D, no dosage adjustments at all. And E, you need more information. Hoping that everybody gets this right. All right, let's see. All right, great, 93% correct. So the answer is D, no dosage adjustment when you start buprenorphine or continue buprenorphine with an integration strain transfer inhibitor. Great, okay. And the next and I think final post-test question, Oops. Oh, yeah. This is the explanation. Apologies, guys. So we talked about clinically significant interactions between ART um, or hep C drugs are um, unlikely, infrequent. Um, neither ART nor meds for substance use disorder should be withheld. There are no clinically significant drug-drug interactions between buprenorphine and first-line ART for HIV, including those integrase strain transfer inhibitors. And there are a few drug-drug interactions between methadone and first-line ART. There is a potentially weak interaction with abacavir. And some references for that. And then our last question, you have a 34-year-old patient. He presents after a re recent admission with pneumonia in a fall. He was diagnosed with alcohol use disorder. He has an eight-year history of HIV and an, a viral load level of 3,000 copies per mil. He reports difficulty adhering to his ART. Which of the following is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy for alcohol use disorder in his case? A, a acamprosate, TID. B, disulfiram daily by mouth. C, extended release injectable naltrexone every month, and D, none of the above. Okay, give you a few more seconds. All right, great, 97% correct. Um, the correct answer is that extended release naltrexone, which most people got, close that poll and give you a full explanation here. Because of difficulties with adherence to ART, this patient may have challenges taking another oral daily medication to treat his alcohol use disorder. However, untreated alcohol use disorder will impair his ability to take his ART and achieve viral load suppression. So it's really imperative that you treat his alcohol use disorder to improve his HIV outcomes. 
Naltrexone long-acting injectable can be delivered every month. It improves viral load suppression. Um, oral, naltrexone, oral naltrexone is an option given daily, can also reduce alcohol use and is FDA approved, but adherence can be an issue and it has more adverse effects than the extended release. Disulfiram would require more monitoring. Remember the disulfiram reaction can cause fatal VFib if someone continues to drink while they're taking it. And a camprosate is also a potential option, but requires three times a day dosing. So it's a challenge for many patients. Um, and some references here. All right, and I think that's it for our cases. We can um, turn it back over to Dr. Springer. Thank you, and excellent job, uh, Ellen. That was wonderful. Um, so we do have several questions. I've been trying to answer a few, and you answered several as well, um, but there's a lot of interest. Um, so let me just start out with, um, uh, I. Uh, some there's been some questions regarding stimulant use methamphetamine and in particular those with opioid use one question was is there benefit to um, prescribing Adderall uh, or another prescribed stimulant um, in patients who also have concurrent opioid use disorder Sorry, I just had to get my water in. Um, yes, yeah, so I actually have read a fair amount about this because I have a lot of young male patients with um, attention deficit with or without hyperactivity and substance use disorder. It is common that those two go together and there is great literature that treating the underlying ADD, ADHD can improve um, substance use outcomes. So it is recommended that we screen for and treat them. If you do not feel comfortable treating the underlying ADHD, there are stimulant and non-stimulant medications, please consider consider referring to someone who does because there is great data um, that it will improve both comorbidities um, and ultimately can improve HIV outcomes. Yep. And what about those who smoke methamphetamine, no help with syringe service programs? Is there anything else besides offering test strips and Narcan? And I think you touched upon some of the treatments for methamphetamine and, and other stimulant use disorders, but... Yeah. I mean, I would say the only other thing that we have used with success is a peer we have a peer who's very engaged and she does a lot of check-ins and she does a lot of counseling and she really capitalizes on those moments when they're ready to make, ready to go to treatment, ready to make some um, life changes. So a peer has been helpful for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, contingency management as you, is the, the probably the best treatment for a stimulant use disorder, but unfortunately, as you said, it's oftentimes difficult to get people in, but peers definitely can be very helpful. Um, and talking about their substance use and um, also other harm reduction strategies, uh, test strips if, and other things. Um, uh, so um, there are a couple of buprenorphine questions. Um, are there benefits to doses higher than 24 milligrams, I, I assume of sublingual buprenorphine? And well, I would say the other part of that is, um, and, uh, using, um, splitting the dose, I guess, instead of once a day. Yeah, I have just read um, of providers who are pushing above 24 milligrams of buprenorphine. I have not used that in my practice. We've talked as a clinic. I think my policy would be to refer to an addiction medicine expert for a one-time consultation about increasing that dose of 24 milligrams and then accepting them back to our clinic to, to prescribe that just with some expert guidance. But I haven't felt comfortable going above 24 milligrams, but I know providers are doing it and I anticipate our guidelines and recommendations will change in this new era of fentanyl. Um, are you using it at higher doses, Sandy? Yeah, sometimes we do, um, but you're, you know, the ceiling effect with buprenorphine, it hits like 95, 99% of the receptors, but in the fentanyl era, we're seeing individuals, even on sublocate, needing sublingual buprenorphine at 24 to 32 milligrams, even higher than that. So I think there's a lot that we're learning, um, but the, you know, asking about craving that one to 10 Likert scale, um, as well as assessing for for withdrawal, it's, it's there's a lot that we're learning all together. But I have seen going up to higher doses in terms of splitting the dose. The, the population I see doing that, we do that the most in is those with chronic or or comorbid pain disorder. We're splitting it into um, a 24 milligram dose into three times a day. There's some benefit to that as well. So, but yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, 
And then is there, is buprenorphine ever used for people without opioid use disorder who have other substance use disorders where they, they're, they're not intentionally searching opioids, but it might be contaminating like fentanyl contaminating a stimulant supply, any um, experience in your behalf or others that you know that are using buprenorphine to treat that? I've actually asked our addiction team about this because we were referred to a patient who had an overdose event, non-fatal, but it was an opioid overdose event, but they were not seeking opioids. They were seeking a stimulant. So the question is, is buprenorphine in itself a harm reduction? If a, you know, if, if a patient is at high risk of recurrent opioid overdose, even though they don't seek it out, our addiction team did not recommend that. They recommended more harm reduction, naloxone, education, fentanyl test strips. That said, I am sure it, this has become enough of a crisis and we're seeing enough fatal overdoses that I am sure there are providers who are prescribing in that context. Um, are you, have you seen that? Um, no, we're doing the same strategy. I think the thing is, um, you know, the same is, as talking to them, educating them. Um, beside, there's fentanyl test strips. We have a lot of xylazine here. So also xylazine test strips. And then also there's drug testing uh, areas where they can test their drugs um, before they use and, um, oh, and Narcan. And then training um, a partner that maybe they have an overdose education. And then if they are going to use, go slow because you don't know if it's contaminated. But I haven't, um, I personally haven't uh, done that yet. But that is a good question. Um, there's a lot of really good questions here. Uh, and then I have some that were sent in as well that I wanted to get to, but, um, so I'm just going to kind of plow through them. Uh, there's some questions about, um, pain control and offering, um, opioid use disorder treatment, in particular, any evidence or that you might know of, of long acting forms of, um, uh, buprenorphine or naltrexone, uh, I guess, for treatment of opioid use disorder, um, when they have chronic pain, um, is there one particular medication that you're aware of that might be better in treating uh, chronic pain when they have opioid use disorder? And does it depend on the type of pain, neuropathic versus musculoskeletal? Yeah, I will be honest. I don't treat a lot of these patients. Um, we, we have the benefit of a pain clinic within our HIV clinic. I know they do use a fair amount of long acting. I think they have used some probufine that we discussed in addition to sublingual buprenorphine. They have not, they've had the same refrigeration challenges with sublocade, but I think um, there are data of using these partial agonist, um, other formulations of um, buprenorphine for pain, um, but I'm just not the expert for those. Yeah, no, it is complicated. And that brings up a good point is that, you know, having a multidisciplinary team, as you've discussed as well, can be very helpful. Know, know what you know, know what you don't know, get advice, get help. We do this all the time. But the key part is not leaving that patient without some some advice. But um, we do like in, in the hospital, we've had patients are on um, uh, uh, sublocate that treats their pain. So we're seeing there's co-treatment of pain. Buprenorphine, as you know, was initiated as a, as an analgesic when not a treatment of opioid use disorder when it was first found. So has some activity, um, methadone definitely, um, has mm -hmm. some neuropathic, uh, 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 pain control. So some people might go to a full agonist. And then there's some data about naltrexone actually having some anti-inflammatory, activity. So, but in terms of pain, you know, there's, there's other, you know, most of us don't go to an opioid antagonist for uh, acute pain, uh, especially if they're on an opioid. Um, there are some questions about initiating buprenorphine. So a couple of questions are to how often do you use urine toxicology screens and, and how you would use them? And the other that was regarding um, how frequently you might have patients come back if they're new to treatment versus established treatment. Those were a couple of the questions regarding that. Yeah, so, um, and this may need to be our last question because it looks like we are at um, 116. But um, in general, when patients are new to me, I will see them up to weekly. Um, and when they're on a stable dose, I space them out to monthly visits. This is very expensive for our clinic because a lot of our patients do not have transportation and live in rural areas. So it is a costly practice. I do telehealth when I can. My state has restrictions that are more restrictive than most states in terms of 
telehealth for opioid use disorder. So that is a barrier for me. When patients are adherent to their buprenorphine, they're in recovery, their viral load is suppressed, I space them out to three months for their opioid use disorder. That is the most I will space them out. And I think that most of the payers for our insurers patients do want to see a urine drug screen, do want to see an encounter at least every three months. So I would say it ranges from weekly to every three months. Yeah. And I was just saying, um, I had mentioned in the chat, just being careful and how you're using it. Um, so, um, if it's helpful for the patient as opposed to punishing them for, um, you know, if, if it's positive for other things, we do have a lot of questions and I do want to remind everybody that the lecture, this, this, webinar as an overview of how to do it. And the previous one was why we should care. Um, but there is another one coming. And the next one is specifically about treatment of opioid use disorder in the era of fentanyl. And that's all it's going to be devoted to. And then the separate one for alcohol and tobacco. So hopefully if we didn't answer your questions there, we will get to them. Um, and I think, are we over now or do we have time? Feel free to go long. Okay, well, it's from the boss. So there is one, a couple of questions that um, Ellen, I did wanna touch upon and that were sent in before. Um, one is, was stated or questioned as, is it possible that once a person who uses drugs or is addicted has overcome social barriers to HIV care and comor comorbidities like mental illness, um, is the need for addiction treatment possibly going to complicate their ma medical management. So I, what I interpret this as persisting with the addiction treatment, are we going to um, potentially complicate their other medical issues? I, um, th I'm so glad that you brought this one up. So I have a fair number. There's still a lot of stigma in my community around buprenorphine and methadone. They are very much viewed as crutches that people are still using if they're using buprenorphine or methadone. I have had several patients who want to kind of self taper or come off of those medications. I will say in the last four years, I've had five patients who through shared decision-making and through their own goals decided to, to do that. And none of them have been able to successfully stay in recovery. Now this is a very vulnerable group. They already have HIV. They live in a rural state. Um, they have untreated mental health and other comorbidities, but I am very hesitant. And I usually have them come back a second. If they express interest in that, I ask them to think about it. I share the literature that patients who maintain engaged in treatment for, with meds for opioid use disorder have better, long, you know, over six months, better HIV outcomes, um, substance use outcomes. I have them come back and talk to them about it again before we really go through with that that taper. Um, but I have not had anybody who has had, now some of them have stayed in recovery for like six months, a year, but all of them have ultimately come back to me and had a return to use and then wanted to come back to us for, um, to resume treatment. How about you, Sandy? Have you had patients who successfully tapered and stayed in recovery? No. Oh. And I think it's really good to point. There's a ton of evidence to show that um, the risk of overdose and death and return to use is substantially high within the 30 days after stopping treatment. Um, so one of the things we have to be careful of is asking patients, why would you want to? Um, and I do hear a lot of pressure from family or other individuals, especially women who are pregnant. And I think we have to be mindful of that, that methadone and as well as buprenorphine are safe in, in pregnancy um, in the worst time actually would be while they're pregnant or postpartum. So um, trying to reassure people, I think is really important. So thank you for that. There's another one I know we have to go, but I just wanted to address this because I know this is you and I talk about this a lot and you just talked about it some more, but for patients um, to, you know, to overcome stigma or misinformation about care that hinders them from engaging in care, how do you enhance a good patient provider relationship where you can allow the patient to articulate their needs without, you know, needing to um, feel concerned or stigmatized and uh, the pro provider can then hopefully um, carry out the necessary services. And I think um, you touched upon this, but just wanted to get your opinion? Um, we, in my clinic, I have the benefit of a very um, harm reduction focused team. I have a nurse who is a lovely um, 
maternal figure, frankly, to a lot of our patients. They call her on her birthday. They call her when they get a new job. I mean, it's just a very um, inclusive, supportive environment. And then I mentioned our peer earlier who frequently checks in and she checks, checks in when they have a return to use and when they are not showing up, she reaches out. So they know that even when they are actively using, we want them to come in. And they know that when they're actively using, we still prescribe buprenorphine as harm reduction. We do not view their urine drug screen as transactional. If you give me this urine, I will give you another prescription. They know it is not a transactional clinic. They know it is a harm redu reduction clinic and that we are here for them regardless of, you know, come as you are. And, and that, I mentioned the nurse and the peer because your staff is as important, if not more important, to create an inclusive stigma-free environment as you are. Um, so I think educating our whole team, we send them to various trainings, we send them to Immersa, we ask them to take, you know, webinars like this, you know. Um, so it really takes getting the whole clinic on board and educating them and re-educating them uh, on the importance of an inclusive environment. Does that kind of answer the question? Yep. And um, in that article, not plugging that article that you and I co-wrote beyond antibiotics and opid, there is a table there that gives some question prompts on how to gently ask questions that are non-stigmatizing and maybe be open-ended to allow the, that dialogue if you're looking for that. So thanks, Ellen. I think we're going to, um, we went over, but this has been an awesome discussion. Just wanted to remind you, um, here's some slides here that evaluation information, how to claim CME, is going to be emailed by 5 p.m. Um, Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. We'll love your feedback. And valuations are really helpful. Um, and the big plug, remember, this is a series, right? Um, so next one is specifically uh, d discussing um, initiating buprenorphine in the fentanyl era in patients with opioid use disorder and HIV by Dr. Leish. Um, and I will be moderating that October 5th. So hopefully you'll join us for that one. If you can't, you can watch the recording like this one. Um, other IAS USA activities, really important to know, implementation of long acting drugs for treatment and prevention of HIV, Monday, November 13th. And that's a really good one. See all the times. And these are some other upcoming awesome webinars that are sponsored by IAS USA. And you can see them all on their website. Um, including this one, update on HIV medicine, uh, emerging challenges, December 12th, to, including the reprieve study, which will be really nice to see. I'll go on that one. So thank you so much for participating on behalf of IAS USA and Dr. Eaton and myself. We really, um, we're glad you joined us. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Ellen. Great job. <laughs>